Greetings, fellow dwarves. Rodamon here. Thank you for tuning in to a brand new series playing Dwarf Fortress called Taming the Wilds. If you would like to skip the setup of this scenario, please use YouTube chapters, and additional information about the series may be found in the description of this video. Episode 1, Taming the Wilds. Before I start, I should explain a little bit of what is Dwarf Fortress for the uninitiated. It is a construction and management simulation game where you play in a procedurally generated world where the player indirectly controls a group of dwarves in an attempt to construct a successful and wealthy fortress. This is fortress mode. There are other modes, but I'm playing fortress mode. Uh, I'm going to be playing very methodically, which also means slow, uh, covering a lot of the in-game mechanics and also building to be very aesthetic and efficient. Uh, it's not exactly a tutorial series, because again, I'm not an expert, but you should be able to learn a lot from this, because I've put enough hours in to kind of know what I'm doing. All right, right at the start here, we're going to generate a new world. So I'm going to create a new world, and this just explains uh, some of the world generations, and I am leaving everything to default. So this is going to be a medium world with 100 years of history, the number of civilizations Sites, beasts, savagery are all medium, and the mineral occurrence is everywhere. Uh, one caveat I would say is when you're generating your own worlds, probably try it on uh, the default, and don't mess with the uh, mineral occurrence because there is a lot of issues with trade and trade volume, and if you tamper with the mineral occurrence, you're in for a bad time. So let's create a world. And what will happen here is it will pr procedurally generate uh, sort of a islandy, continenty thing and then create a hundred years of history for us to play into. So right now it's generating the terrain and rivers, lakes, setting up the minerals, mineral scarcity, vegetation, and then plopping in civilizations with their own history and developments. Which is pretty cool. The events up, up on the top left aren't particularly important for you to be appraised of. Um, or at least not that I've noticed. These are just large world events that happened and it's just taking note of random ones as the years truck along. And we're up to year n number 95. Once you hit a year 100, uh, you can either play as it is or you can return back to the menu. So here it is. We are in the Age of Myth, year 100. And this is the wondrous realm of wind. All right, let's play. The next thing to do is embark. So one of the tricky things about embarking is there is a lot of map tiles that you can settle. And not all of them are really well suited for new players. In fact, some of them are horribly like a terrifying map tile with a heavy aquifer. Yeah, don't do that as a new player. So here you get a choice between fortress and legends mode. I'm going to be playing fortress mode. That is sort of the default. And then it passes a few weeks to get things ready. And the months, as you can see, are granite, slate, so on and so forth. So I'm going to be skipping the tutorial because I want to be able to pick my own fortress location and not be saddled with a tutorial, which is just window menu UI. And just I'll be doing the tutorial myself. It might not be as complete as the in-game tutorial, but at least it's supplementary. So if you're a new player, uh, go through this tutorial, but then also this video should be able to help as well. So one thing that I should say is I really like worlds that aren't individual islands so that you can traverse them. This world does not meet that criteria, but I think it's okay. If we take a look here, there is a, uh, a channel here which separates the north and the south. Uh, so if we settle on the south or settle on the north, there's not going to be an easy way to get to the other side. Think of like Westeros and the Inland Sea with the Dothraki on the other side, something like that. It also looks like uh, a lot of the civilizations are down here in this mountain range and here in this mountain range and not a lot up top north, but that doesn't really matter. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click find embark location, which is here. And I'm going to say, give me savage lands. So there's three types of lands. There's savage, there's normal, and there's calm. And this just sort of affects uh, sort of the creatures that you see. 
Uh, calm creatures are going to be easier to hunt. They're not beastly and large and dangerous. Uh, and then untamed wilds or uh, up savag savagery is particularly larger creatures at times. Uh, then there's also spirit. Spirit is way more of a dial for difficulty, whereas evil spirit would be very difficult. Um, roaming hordes of necromancers, that kind of thing. Whereas uh, good spirit is very gentle. I would say that you probably don't need to play on good spirits, even as a new player, as long as you understand the fundamentals. Because regardless of the spirits and savagery, a lot of the initial uh, failures of a, of a fortress is going to be like dehydration, starvation, that kind of thing, or digging too deep too fast. Um, but I'm going to be playing on Untamed Wilds with, uh, with normal spirit, I think. And then I'm also going to say Flux Stone Layer. Yes. I highly advise new players to do Flux Stone Layer. What Flux is, is it allows you to make steel. Trade is pretty limited in this game. And if you don't have Flux Stone on your home tile, it's going to be very difficult for you to make steel, which is one of the most efficient um, materials in order to make arms and armor. So if you don't have Flux Stone on your home tile, you're going to have to buy it all. And that's going to be real rough. Uh, and then aquifers, I'm going to say no. What an aquifer is, is it's underground water. And because we're digging down, it, when you hit underground water, it becomes very difficult to descend deeper into the mountain or earth. Um, and aquifers, light aquifers, you can kind of deal with uh, where you wall them up and dig through them. Heavy aquifers are even harder to deal with. At that point, you start needing to use floodgates and pumps. It's not new user flight friendly, so I'm going to turn those off. And then what's going to happen is it's going to uh, sort of scan the map for locations that meet my criteria. Um, and they'll turn green. And then parcel matches are turning yellow. So these are all the potential spots that it could settle into. So there's a spot down there. And then I'm going to just look over all the spots. And what I'm going to be looking for is, because I'm a relatively new player, I want to settle somewhere with a decent amount of trees, if possible. Because... Um, having an easy access wood source is very handy early on. I don't want something that is too cold or too hot. Temperate would be ideal. And then I want something with um, neighbors nearby, but not on top of me. So that there is trade interaction with other factions, um, but there isn't, you know, horrible things showing up on my doorstep constantly. And this continent... Uh, looks not hopeful so far. I don't really like settling way west. I'm hoping... So no, none of these forests are applicable. Come on now. I might have to generate another world. Luckily, that goes pretty quick when I'm not trying to explain how this all works. So let's hope that is the case. Oh, there's a tiny bit of forest up north. Hmm. And down there, too. And then once it's done uh, scanning, we can analyze each individual tile uh, to try to pick our favorite. And I would say embarking is very important because if you fail to be choosy in this stage, you can get stuck with a very bad starting spot. So this is the first place that uh, I'm looking at here. Uh, we have got goblins in this area here. So goblins are very close, but elves and humans are pretty close too. Um, and then this, these tiles, this is savannah, so it has a few trees, but this is heavily forested. So I could settle this corner for forest. And that would be pretty good. It has flux stone, sand, a little soil, and some close neighbors. So this is a probably really good contender. Uh, all of these are... Where? Okay, this is the goblins. They live there. Got it. Uh, taking a look at this spot. Whoa, this is oversettled. I don't want to be here. I like broadleaf forest, but that's a little too busy. So yeah, we're going to go with conifer forest. I don't think uh, I was going to pick out here. This is all swampland and marsh. And it seems very remote. There's, like, almost no one nearby. So, uh, yeah. Well, where was it? It was here. Now, I could settle on this brook here. That wouldn't be terrible. Uh, that would give me the ability to drink water. One of the big things in Dwarf Fortress is you have to feed your dwarves, and they have to basically be drunk all the time. They can drink water, but it will upset them. Children do need water. Um, speaking of water, hydrate. But, uh... But brooks will freeze over in the winter, so you have to find underground water sources at some point. But yeah, let's settle a brook. Why not? 
So it looks like there are goblins that live here, but whatever, I don't care. And then the only thing to note is you don't want something with a light or heavy aquifer, which is in the purple up top. That would be a problem. And then sand and clay just allows you to make glass and, and pottery, uh, clay pottery. Not a big deal if, if, if you're just going to focus on like rock or whatever. So I'm going to say embark somewhere on this river. Uh, I'm gonna, going to put the river to my north like that. Now, you do have the ability to prepare carefully, but I would advise if you're new to just hit play now. The reason being is there's some things that if you don't bring with you when you're preparing carefully, you're screwed, like absolutely screwed. If you don't bring an anvil or you don't bring picks or you don't bring an ax, it's going to be a bad time because you're basically going to be stunted, majorly stunted. And then I'm going to leave enemies on normal, economy on normal, no custom settings, everything default. So let's get right to it. Uh, the only disadvantage of um, playing immediately is you don't get to really name anything. Like your fortress or government or whatever, but whatever. So a Dwarven outpost, you have arrived. Uh, after a journey from the mountain homes into the forbidding wilderness beyond, your harsh trek has finally ended. Your party of seven is to make an outpost for the glory of all of... Uh-oh. Uh, Stesokaral? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep, off to a good start. I don't speak Dwarven. There are almost no supplies left, uh, but we are here. This place is going to be called Zoludmibil, Mebil, or Future Tomes. Nice. I can take Future Tomes. So right at the start here, I'm going to pause. Because we need to take a few things in and analyze our terrain and surroundings. Uh, so let me... Give me one second. Let me explain some of the fundamental concepts right at the start here. So this is the finite zone that you have. There are Z levels and elevations. Um, we are sort of in the highland. As you can see, trees are everywhere. So there's going to be plenty of wood. There is this river, this brook in the middle. Um, it is passable on foot. It will freeze when it's cold. We're right in the middle with a wagon, and this wagon has some cloth and seeds and tools and weapons and mead or uh, things to drink and things to eat, that kind of stuff. Um, we're also going to start with seven people. So we have the expedition leader, who's very important, or she's very important, and then um, six other random people with some pets and livestock. So we have two dog or three dogs, three cats, four cats. Uh, we do have a one guinea hen, so that's an egg layer, and then two horses, male and female. Um, I'm probably going to want to geld... Oh, no, these are all... Okay, I'm going to want to geld the stray male kitten because cat explosion. Basically, you get so many animals that it bogs down your, your game. Um, we have some ponds, which are good for fishing and water in a pinch if it's not winter. And then a lot of, like, overland crops. Uh, things to do right before you even start playing. Um, what we want to go is go into labor, which is down here. Let me explain the UI a little bit. So you, you up here, you have your wealth, um, trade information, that kind of stuff. This gets unlocked when you have a bookkeeper. Uh, but I'm not going to get a hell myself. So then there's population and how happy they are. So we have seven people on neutral happiness. Um, stockpiles. And these stockpiles are going to be, some of them are going to be sort of guesses because I don't have a bookkeeper keeping track, but you can hire a bookkeeper to get an exact count. So it says like, oh, kind of 30, right? Um, food, drinks, seeds, meat, fish, plants, and other. This is the uh, the date, the 15th of granite, which is early spring. Uh, then the top right, you have the mini map. You've got pause, play, settings, and then help. Here, Shows a recenters on the surface at this location. So if you're off in a corner and you want to go, hey, show me the surface, boom, done. Uh, likewise, this button is show the deepest point that we have discovered in the current location. So if you want to go to the basically the bottom of roughly what you're looking at, that button does that. Uh, this will show water numerically, like how much water seven, which is full of water. One would be like a trickle, like kind of a puddle on the ground. 
And then the other here is showing up ramps. So ramps, it's a really easy way to visualize where you can walk up and down. Uh, so for instance, if we removed all of the ramps on this mountain, the mountain would become impassable. You can turn it into a fortress that way. Uh, I'm not going to be playing that way, but it is possible. Uh, then down here, we've got, this is the citizens information. So we have our citizens, our pets and livestock, other and dead and missing uh, tasks, what people are currently working on. Uh, I don't really have places, zones, stockpiles, workshops yet, but uh, that will come. In nobles and administrators, uh, this is one thing that I'm going to do right now, because what I can do is set my expedition leader up to become a whole bunch of things. So the expedition leader is named Irush, and will be probably raffled off at some point, but I'm going to make them also my militia commander, so that if I do have an incursion of enemies, I can draft them to fight. Uh, I'm also going to make them the manager, which... Uh, a manager handles work orders. This is very, very important early on. It will help you automate. Basically, make until you have X is kind of what the manager does. And then um, I can also make them a broker. The broker is responsible for trade deals. It looks like they are the best broker because they're adequate negotiator and persuader. So that's good. Uh, and then I'm also going to make them the bookkeeper to have them keep a good account of our stocks. I could put this planter who's a proficient record keeper in it, but I'd rather just have my expedition leader saddled with all of the administrative stuff for now. Um, eventually I'm gonna get a medical dwarf, but uh, I'm not gonna have a chief medical dwarf just yet because no one's hurt and hopefully I can keep it that way. All right. Um, so then the next thing we wanna do is to try to figure out where we wanna dig. So what I like to do, just as my own design style, is definitely have a mostly subterranean uh, fortress, except for on the surface, maybe some perimeter defenses, a pasture for animals, maybe some surface um, farming. And that's about it. Mostly putting everything on underground, just as a personal preference. And, and the reason is because when you build above ground, it takes a lot of uh, shipping of resources, moving of materials, that kind of thing. It, it basically is a lot more labor intensive to build above ground than below ground. Just my two cents. So then the other things we have down here is the tasks menu, um, places, so on and so forth. Um, a lot of these you don't really need just yet, like objects. We don't have any artifacts in the colony or justice. Nobody's committed crimes. Um, then here are the bottom UI options. So we have dig, chop down trees, gather plants. Smooth or engrave walls, erase, build, stockpiles, um, meeting areas, burrow. What a burrow is, is sort of like zone restrictions in RimWorld, where you can say, hey, in the case of danger, um, only go to these specific areas, and then um, your civilians should enter that specific area that you've designated safe. Uh, Minecarts, and then this is priority movement. So, for instance, oh, one way to do walking access restriction is if you have, like, a shooting range, you don't want people walking in front of the people shooting the targets. So, this would be a good use of uh, walking restrictions. Um, and then the last button is things to dump, things to smelt, things to hide. I don't find hiding things particularly useful, but, like, dumping and smelting and unlocking is kind of useful. All right. So, take a look at all this. Uh, one, one thing that I'll probably end up doing is having some sort of uh, surface uh, pasture. So if I create a pasture in the zones here, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just create a temporary pasture for the animals that I have so that uh, they don't starve, but they're they're corralled. And I'm just going to put all the animals in there for now. I'm not going to really worry about it. Um, this is a pretty small area next to the river, but that's not a big deal. So then the next thing I'm going to do is go to my labor here and I know I'm moving really fast and I'm going to say to the mason the expedition leader and the miner they all should be miners and then this button locks them into only that job so the miner the mason and the expedition leader can only mine I'm only allowing them to mine on purpose um, some other things to do would be to the planters I only want the planter to do planting and harvesting for that matter uh, so they get better yields. There's also some other things to do while I'm here. 
Uh, in the kitchen, I don't want to use plump helmets, which is a type of crop, for cooking. I want to only brew it. For seeds, I'm not going to allow them to be cooked, but they're all off by default. So you start off with um, six types of seeds, and they're subterranean plants that you can only grow underground. Um, then I'm also not going to allow dwarven ale, rum, or wine to be cooked. So a lot of the meals you can cook with alcohol, but if you do that, you can end up with a severely depleted alcohol stock, and then your uh, dwarves will dehydrate to death. Um, and then, you know, cook with meat and fish, because you can't brew with that stuff. Uh, some other things that you could do is go to standing orders, and do not collect webs. So one of the things that ends up happening pretty early on in a game is you'll dig, and then you'll open up some underground cavern, and... If you have automatic web collection, what will happen is um, immediately people will start going into those caverns, whether or not it's safe for them to do, and start collecting webs for tailoring and get themselves killed. It's very dumb. Don't do it. Um, over in Siege and Forbidding, something else to do here is um, forbid other non-hunted dead. So if there's, like, dead enemies on the map tile or whatever, you're just not hauling them, because that's not... There's no real point to do that. Uh, let's see. Is there anything else? If you do have, like, an outdoor area that you're trying to keep nice, you might want to turn on um, workers will clean up outdoor vermin remains. I'm not going to worry about that, because I don't have outside stuff yet. And you can also decide whether children do chores or do not do chores. But I don't have any children, so that's not a big deal. And then I'm going to also say farmers only harvest. I don't want uh, anyone else to harvest other than the farmers, uh, but I've already kind of done that in the labor menu with planters only being allowed to plant. So farmers, planters will plant, and then they will only be the ones that can harvest as well. All right. So now I think we're safe to strike Earth. I know it's like already 20 minutes late, but uh, so now that I have the three miners... I have three miners because I have three mining picks. So I'm going to basically maximize the amount of people that are mining. Um, Rigoth is going to be mining a lot faster because they're proficient. The other two have no skills for mining. If they did, it would show here that they were like a novice or something. But mining is one of those skills that you build up really quick. Some skills are very hard to build up quickly, like armor smithing, for instance, because there's a lot of resources that go into it. But like mining and smoothing and stone cutting, that kind of stuff, you, you can max out relatively fast. Uh, and then I am, instead of doing a stairwell, I'm going to do a ramp. So the reason to use a ramp is periodically you're visited by trade wagons. And if you don't have a ramp, if, if you don't have a ramp into your fortress, you either need your trade spot on the surface so the wagons can get to it. Or they just won't be able to get to your uh, trade area. So um, ramp building is really kind of odd if you ask me, but here's how it works. I'm going to dig here. I'm going to dig, uh, let's channel. So there's different types of digging. A stairwell is just like a vertical column of stairs that go up like a spiral staircase. Uh, but ramps can't use stairwells. So I don't want a stairwell in this case. Uh, a channel sort of just digs a pit. You can think of it as a pit. And if there's walls next to the pit, it will be sort of ramped. Uh, so I'm going to dig that. And then while I dig that, I'm going to queue my woodcutter. Because I do have a woodcutter. Uh, a woodcutter who's also a, a woodworker. I'm going to queue him up to cut some trees. And I'm just going to hand pick the trees. For aesthetics, I think what I want to do is pick uh, all trees of one type. So all of my initial constructions, like beds and the whatnot, are all of the same wood. Um, some of the fruit trees will drop their fruit when it ripens. So if you can cut, if you can focus on cutting non-fruiting trees, there might be a little bit of advantage. On this map tile, there's so many trees, it's really probably not a big deal. Because there's more fruit up here than I'm ever going to need to collect. Um, but if the trees are a bit more scarce, and you have a choice between cutting a willow tree, for instance, which yields wood... Or cutting a, you know, a fruit tree. Uh, cut the willow. Or the pine. So right now I'm just uh, hand-selecting pine. And then 
while that's all happening, the other people standing around are going to have much to do. So I'm going to tell them to just gather a whole bunch of cro uh, plants. And if you take a look at the labor here, uh, everyone can gather plants, except for the people that are locked out of it. So what's likely to happen is my metal crafter and planter will start gathering plants. The woodworker will cut trees. The fisher dwarf will um, probably fish. And then the miner, mason, and expedition leader will start digging. Uh, at this point, we can also set up um, zones for water if we want. I do have it in the uh, in the preferences here that we aren't. It's not necessary. Uh, where is that again? Places, uh, wherever it is, you can tell them to basically only use designated water sources or prefer to use designated water sources. So I'm just going to say like this is the mini pond, and then. That's for water if we need it. And then for fishing, I'll just put a little zone here and call it fishing. Cool. All right, so let's strike some earth. So there's the channel. Uh, and I'm going to turn on the slopes so you can see it a little bit better. And then I'm going to start ramping down. And I'm going to have it three wide because that's how wide the... Uh, that's how wide the... The wagons require so I'll just build you you could build it one wide but because I've employed um, three diggers might as well just do three wide and it's gonna look like a, a ramp going down it's a little hard to visualize um, but don't screw up because it's really challenging to fix it and there are some important layers to note here so the first subterranean layer is black sand then it's yellow sand, and then it's dolomite wall. Uh, I was pretty sure that this map tile had soils, but uh, I could be wrong. It it's, doesn't really bother me either way. Farming is um is really not a major way that you keep your dwarves alive. So what I'm looking for is to go down ideally to flux stone level. That would be what I would prefer. Um, so that the 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 stones that we're collecting, shale and hematite, oh, that's not bad. The stones that we're collecting can be used for steel later on. Because when you excavate for an under uh, subterranean uh, fortress, it's more efficient to excavate on layers that are made up of material that you're going to want later on. So rather than to end up with buckets of buckets of sand, I'd rather have buckets of iron ore and shale you know if given those two options and because we don't i'm not likely to interact with the outside world all that often um it's not that big of a deal that i have to go down a few extra z levels so i'll probably settle actually you know what let me erase that i'm gonna settle this level here and i'm gonna build up like this. So I'm going to go up 3, 6, 9, 12 tiles. There we go. And this is a shale level, which will yield a bunch of rock, which I can turn into furniture and crafts and, and bins and buckets. Well, no, jugs, that kind of thing. You also notice that there's, um, there's gems in the walls. I'm not going to worry about gems right now. Uh, because there is so much material that we're going to be able to yield from this. It's going to be ridiculous. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is start to do some um, civic planning. And I, I'm not going to be able to field questions while I do this. So w one thing I want at the bottom of this is I have this extra long so that I can put in a drawbridge. So in the case of um, uh, invaders coming on the overworld, I can pull the bridge and prevent them from coming into my burrow, into my fortress. Uh, so there'll be a drawbridge in this length here. And then right at the bottom of the drawbridge, more or less, I'm going to put a zone for uh, trade. So a trade spot is a 5x5 five five area. Um, and because I love symmetry so much, let me make sure this is symmetrical. So 5, 
So this is 13 by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And I'm not going to dig all of this out now. This is sort of just like me using it as a planning tool. So the trade spot will go in the middle there. And then it will have a sort of a wall around it. Uh, mostly for aesthetics. But also so that I can protect them with a mini drawbridge if I, I see fit. Um, something like that. Maybe even a little bit larger. That way, um, when it comes to drawbridges, creatures can climb up a, a one deep hole. Some creatures can climb up a one deep hole, and then they can also uh, bridge a, a certain gaps. Uh, I'll get more into that later when I'm actually making the bridge. But yeah, that should be enough. That way, I can put a mini drawbridge here and actually protect those that are inside. So I'm going to leave this so that we actually can't gain access to it where I'm cutting it up like this um, so that I'm only mining what is absolutely needed to be mined now. All right, next, I'm going to go from really high level. So really, really high level. Uh, I think what I'm going to want is a... I'm going to put another sort of drawbridge tunnel here eventually. And this will go lead to the underground. So all of this is uh, all of this is not actually planned. This is sort of generalized, but this is where going down into the earth will start. Enemies can also emerge and attack you from underground. In fact, that's often more common. So you're, I'm also going to be designing a drawbridge to separate out where people live with the mining tunnels, which is important. Uh, then up here, it's kind of the same idea, but this is going to be eventually a tavern. Uh, sometimes taverns can have uh, unwanted guests or brawls or or renegades or whatever. So it's also nice to be able to separate the tavern out from the rest of the people. That way, in a case of uh, a devastating brawl, you can at least protect uh, parts of your community from being involved. Um, it's not going to be this boring square. This is just a, a, f a filler for where it will eventually be. Which means that the last direction is going to be this direction. And this is going to be the start of the fortress. And as you can see, I've separated it out so that we can't dig there. Um, so the start of the fortress, I'm going to be setting up what I would consider very temporary stockpiles and temporary work areas, and then eventually evolve into long-term, highly more efficient zones. Don't over plan at the start because what will end up happening is you'll spend like two weeks digging and then everyone will starve and die. So you need to be able to get a still up and running to brew beers. Uh, you need a kitchen to make meals. You need a workshop and a metalsmith and uh, a stone worker and these kind of thing early on. And then they're so, so inexpensive to build that you can just break them down and move them around or do whatever. Um, so the important part of this is now just the planning stage. So, in planning, uh, I'm going to have yet another bridge here in this area. Uh, I'll just, for the benefit of you, say the bridge is going to be somewhere around here. And this is for twofold reasons. One, um, sometimes bridges, sometimes invaders get past your first bridge before you realize that they've arrived. Unlike RimWorld, where they announce themselves at the edge of the map, and it's like, hey, we're going to attack you. Uh, attackers here, sometimes you won't even know, um, like vampires or werewolves can come into your community and you have no idea until there's a full moon. You're like, oh, great. Uh, they're a were dwarf. That's cool. Or they're a vampire and they're sucking everyone's blood and everyone's dying. But for traditional attacks, um, you'll only see them when either an animal or a dwarf sees them. So having redundancy bridges are nice. And then the other thing I'm going to do uh, roughly in this area, let me uh, see if I can't set it up. Roughly in this area is this is where I'm going to have my military stationed. So I'm going to have uh, a barracks for soldiers so that I can lock access to the rest of the community and have the soldiers sally out and meet the threats. So that's the reason for uh, redundant bridges. So if I have this as a mustering soldier area, let me paint that better. 
And of course, um, all of this makes sense up here. I totally get that this isn't going to make sense for you, you know, because I can't, like, label these zones. Uh, so we're going to have soldiering here where the bridge is going to go roughly around here so that the soldiers can leave with everyone else locked up and being safe. And then this spot, I'm going to have spill out to um, sort of the Great Hall concept. So I'm going to have to do some counting here. Uh, three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21. Look about right. Yes. Okay, that's perfect. So the Great Hall is just sort of um, a communal area where people will convene uh, in order to... F for animals without a pasture to hang out, for people to spread news, uh, sort of like a, a family room or a TV room, but for dwarves. Uh, it doesn't really serve a specific purpose. It's just a really nice building to have, in my opinion. So this is going to be sort of the Great Hall area, um, but I'm not going to be building it all because I am planning on um, doing the bare minimum at the start so that I can actually get a lot of stuff done. But I just wanted to justify all of what I, you currently see going on so you understand it. So this whole area is eventually going to be excavated with a multiple level... Um, Alright. Underneath the Great Hall... I think what I'm going to do is put a main stockpile. So there's a lot of reasons to use task specific stockpiles like, oh, my carpenter needs wood and a place to put furniture, right? And that makes the work area a lot more efficient. Uh, but that comes really sort of mid mid game when you're building up work districts really early on. You need just somewhere to put stuff because what ends up happening is, um, your wagon is full of stuff, and that stuff's going to get stolen, right? And eaten by wild animals and the like. So, put your stuff somewhere safe is kind of an important concept. Also, at this point, I'm going to hit this, which is locations. And I'm just going to save this as Great Hall. And bind it. So anytime I hit F2, I will zoom straight to the Great Hall. F1 is the wagon. I'll eventually rewind F1 when I destroy the wagon when I break it down for materials. Um, so what I'm going to do at this point is create uh, some work districts. So if this is the Great Hall and we have a stockpile underneath it, I'm going to put, uh, let's say... Am I not counting right? No, this is too big. Did I count everything wrong? I'm afraid I have. Here, let me uh, redo this really quickly. Because I'm bad at math. I wanted them seven size, not eight. So that there's like a middle spot to them. And this is why I have to hyper focus because. There we go. That's a seven by seven. Because there isn't an easy way to like plan so much. Alright, so this comes... Oops. Great hall area. And then we'll start to have work districts. And I know I'm getting close to the edge of the map. You can't build off the edge of the map, but that's fine. So I think what I'm going to do is uh, initially I'll have a work district um, here. So I'm going to put carpenter and mason and all of this stuff is going to be sort of like starter. And then up here, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to have a still and a kitchen area as well. And then back here, uh, I'm going to set up bedrooms. The only concern that you have for, like, a dormitory or where people sleep is uh, they don't like to be around noise. It disturbs their sleep. So it's important to make sure that they're not near active mining or 
engraving or fortifications, that kind of thing, because it will disturb their sleep. And well, nobody, nobody wants that. So this might be a dining room or something. And then I'll put the, the, uh, I'll put the dorm room on the other side. And these are definitely sort of temporary and, um, and very likely to be moved at some later time. Uh, then the next thing I'm going to do is prioritize. So everything right now has a priority of four, but I'm going to priority three the stuff that I need promptly. And then I also want to erase the middle. So I'm going to go down this way. Oops. Priority three. I'm going to dig down this way and start where I'm going to set up the carpentry and the stoneworking. And then I can unpause and have them start digging. And then eventually what I'll do is I'll do a priority three up for the same reason for the still and the kitchen and the fishery. And then the center of these are empty so that I can make stairwells. And I'm going to do the same thing here. I need to delete the old stairwell. That'd be annoying to have. Uh, so that we can have multiple levels. Hey, Rawl. Thank you for the resub. And everybody else that I've been ignoring because I'm hyper-focused. Cheers to you all. Uh, taking a look at the overland. They are still gathering plants. And all you really need to do is to make sure that they're not idle. So that they're doing something. That's why I dragged a large gather plant zone. The other thing that I could do is I could create a an actual permanent gather plant zone. So because I'm not likely to uh, ever scroll up all that often... Gather hill plants. There. All those plants up on the hill are automatically set up to be gathered. So we are running into Cinnabar, which is a heavy stone, and Hematite, which is a, a good source of iron, and then Shale, which is just a generic stone we can turn into uh, tables and chairs and the like. Uh, there are Tetrahydrate, which is like copper and silver mixed together. And all this stuff will eventually get smelted or gem cut, sold, traded, etc. I'm not too concerned about trying to obtain minerals at this point. We just want the fundamentals of uh, uh, laying out our fortress. So the ground of the cavern floor is shale. So shale is going to be the, probably the dominant stone on this level. So if I need to build walls, uh, shale walls are going to be where it's at. If. I'm going to attempt to not build too many walls, but rather just smooth them all out instead, at least initially. And yeah, the initial layout is critical. Uh, so in my head cannon, I would say the reason I went down uh, below this hematite level is I'm going to eventually build on that hematite level too. So I wanted to get below the dolomite. Um, what I like to do is, is have my, my grand hall be below a universal temple to everybody so up here i'm going to set these on five this is how i like to build certainly there's a little bit of rhyme and reason to this but you don't need to copy my rhyme or reason uh so in terms of religion in dwarf fortress i should back up a little bit um people need to be able to pray to their gods to be happy it's one of the it's one of the few things that dwarves need. Dwarves need a bed. Uh, not initially, you get a little bit of a grace period, but they need a bed to sleep on. They need uh, beer to drink or some sort of alcohol to drink. They need food, and they need prayer. And those are like the the, the big ones. And then I guess protection in their hierarchy of needs. So um, what I like to do initially, because it's affordable, is to have a temple that is not dedicated to a specific deity and just be a general temple. It's not going to satisfy their needs exactly, but uh, it will at least keep them relatively happy. And then what I like to do with that temple is after I build that set up temple, I like to have many dedicated temples to the deities that have the most worshipers. And this is actually very similar to like ancient Greece or ancient Rome, where you'll have the big temple to like Jupiter or whatever, and then smaller temples to like Europa or Io or whatever, you know, you know what I mean? So... I like to design that way, and right above the Grand Hall, I like to put my main temple, my temple to all deities, and then have 
if if I'm able art art wise fractally um, set up uh, side temples off of that. So this is probably big enough for a main temple. Um, and then all I'm going to probably do here is to have like a door to it. Maybe maybe a four sided door. So just just because it will look nice. So something like this. And I don't want to get I want to get away from like perfect symmetry. So there's a little bit of artistry in it. But I, I like that. This pattern's fine. The only thing to note is it's off center. You know, we're not uh, roughly the dead center is the ramp into the colony. So this is uh, definitely off center, meaning that we can't go as far west or north as we can go east or south. But it shouldn't really matter because likely we're only going to have like, I don't know, six to 12 extra mini temples dedicated to separate gods and not like a thousand. Um, our pantheon is not that large. And you can see what people believe in here. If you go to the relations, um, Irish, our expedition leader, believes in Reg. And these are, as far as I could tell, I'm not sure about this. I'm not the authority, but I'm pretty sure they're like procedurally generated. There's a lot of procedural generation. Um, so for instance, I think instruments are procedurally generated. So the instruments that your dwarves play are like random instruments that are different in every game, for instance. Uh, this person believes in Adil, Dorena, whatever that is. I'm not even saying that. So everybody's going to have slightly different beliefs, but it's most efficient to Ostar. It's most efficient to have to have the temples to the people that have the most believers. And that way, um, once you do that and you build up a large enough uh, prayer area, you can have priests and the like. So kind of an important concept. All right. You can see our food going up. That's from all the foraging that we're doing on the surface here. Uh, you can actually see how clear cut this looks as a result. Uh, have I cut down or key? Oh, no, there are some pine trees have that have yet to be cut. I'm just going to queue a few more because uh, wood is very, very important. Uh, wood allows you to make things like coal for smelting and all tons of furniture and storage items and things like that. Uh, but eventually, as you gain a relationship with the elves, uh, they want to severely restrict amount of wood that you chop down because they love the trees. They're tree huggers. Uh, so, yeah, that can be annoying. In fact, it will be annoying at some point. All right, so here we are. And the first workshops I'm going to set, and let me update my priority here. Um, Lay out the fortress. The first ones I'm going to set up are going to be a stone worker and a carpenter. A stone worker makes furniture and stuff like that out of stone. And then a carpenter does the same with uh, wood. And those are the two most important early on. The carpenter is going to be able to make beds. And the, um, the stone worker is going to be able to make tables and chairs. So I'm going to make these out of the native... Um, native stone, which would be shale, just so that they look blended in. Uh, some of these, not all stone is the same. So some stone is flux stone. I haven't found flux stone yet. And then other stones, some are like heavier or lighter. And the differences here is like, if you're going to make rock jugs to carry liquids, it might make sense to make those jugs out of a light stone like jet and not a heavy stone like cinnabar. I don't know the full details. I don't have it all memorized, but most of the materials are somewhat differentiated from one another. Uh, but for stone, it's probably easiest to think of it as like, does this stone break down into a powder for casts? Yes or no? That would be like gypsum. Um, does this stone make iron? Is it? Uh, can it make pig iron, rather, for steel? That would be like limestone, uh, marble, chalk. Those kind of stones are pig iron stones. And you can actually see this here if I go... It's somewhere in the UI. Let me poke around. Uh, stone use. Here it is. So, like, alabaster makes plaster powder. Um, we have got limestone and marble makes pig iron bars. So, those are really important to have. So, why I mention this is you probably shouldn't be building walls and structures out of limestone or marble unless you have a crazy amount of it. 
because it's crucial in the production of steel. So certain stones should be set aside as special, um, like the ones that make steel, but the rest be damned. They're basically all the same. So like dolomite can can make flux. So I have two levels of dolomite above me. Uh, chalk can make flux and quick lime and so on and so forth. All right, so over here we've got uh, Carpenter. Make that a shale. And I'm just mentioning this so that I, I don't use up my, like, flux stones. And it will also tell you what you've run into. Most of this here is just uh, gems that are in the in the walls. And you can see the they're colored differently. I'll show you how to, like, strip mine later on. Right now it's just laying this out. So the other thing I'm going to run into is as all of my people are um, sort of prevented from building, um, they are not going to be setting up the carpenter or stone worker. Um, so I'm going to want to change that. But now what I'm doing is opening up this side uh, so that I can set up the still, the kitchen, and the fishery. Because we do have a fisher dwarf, and that fisher dwarf is basically not doing anything because there's no way to process the fish. How are we doing up here? Checking in on them. Nobody's idle. They're gathering plants still, so they're they're busy. Then after we do that, after we dig that up. Um, the one place I want to go once they're done with this is to the dining room, which will be here, and the dormitorium, which will be there. And I'm going to dig the entire room out so that I can make it nice and spacious and fit people into it. So I'm going to set this to two so it's done first, and then set this to three, and then everything else to fours. Thank you for tuning in to Dwarf Fortress Taming the Wilds, which originally streamed live on Twitch December 27th. If you have any feedback or questions for me, let me know in the comments below. But please keep in mind that I'm a relatively new player, and I'd like to learn at my own pace. If you'd like to join a live stream of mine, Rodamont.com has a link to Twitch, as well as my stream schedule. If you'd like to join my gaming community, Rodamont.com also has a link to Discord, as does the description of this video. Thank you so very much for watching. A special thank you to my Patreon patrons, Twitch subscribers, and viewers like you that support the channel and made it all the way to the credits. Farewell, my fellow dwarves.